everybody. Um, my name is Allison Hewitt, and I am the Senior Fellow in Social Innovation here at the Mars Discovery District. I'm very pleased to have you all, and uh, I think we're in for a very interesting uh, discussion. And we're hoping, as I explained to you, that it's going to be uh, incredibly interactive. So we're going to keep the prepared remarks pretty short. Uh, but the minister is going to start with the presentation, and then the two other panelists, uh, Alex Ryan, who works with me here at Mars and is our uh, VP, leads the Mars Solutions Lab, will be saying a few words, and Charles Finley, a uh, former Martian, uh, but uh, works for Code for Canada and many other wonderful things, is going to uh, talk a little bit about their work, and then we're going to just go right into Q&A. Okay, so I hope you're ready for some interaction. Yes, because it'll be really boring if you don't know. <laughs> um, and we don't want that. Uh, so uh, let me just get started by introducing the minister. I'm just going to say a few words. Uh, and maybe I'll go to the mic. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? yeah? Okay, fantastic. Sure. So um, uh, the minister's name is Audrey Tang. Yes, I go, you're close to a process. And uh, the minister's comfortable going by Audrey. So Audrey is known for uh, revitalizing the computer languages Perl and Haskell, as well as building the online spreadsheet system, Ethical, in collaboration with Dan Bricklin. Does that mean stuff to people? Mm -hmm. yes. Awesome. <laughs> okay. uh, in the public sector, Audrey serves on Taiwan National Development Council's Open Data Committee and the K-12 Curriculum Committee and led the country's first e-rulemaking project to join the cabinet as digital minister on August 1st in 2016. In the private sector, Audrey works as a consultant with Apple on computational linguistics, with Oxford University Press on crowd lexography, and with social text on social interaction design. In the third sector, Audrey actively contributes to Taiwan's Gov Zero. I'm really interested in hearing more about that. A vibrant community focused on focusing on creating tools for the civil society with the call to fork the government. You really have to be careful on that one, don't you? <laughs> so, it's incredibly interesting. So, for, so, so Minister, if I'm calling upon you, please uh, kick us off with a few words. Awesome. Um, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and do we have a portable mic with you? OK, that's much better. Hi. Um, yeah, so. Um, Actually, without the mic, I'm, I'm sure everybody can still hear me. Uh, that's great. Yeah. So, really happy to be here, and uh, feel free to start asking questions on the Secretive app. And this is literally my office. I just want to uh, show the office. It's not quite Mars, <laughs> but it is uh, the Taiwan Social Innovation Lab, and it's co-created by hundreds of social innovators. Um, and some, a bit of a personal story, uh, in Taiwan, uh, we uh, were a relatively new uh, democratic country and uh, unlike many people today working on democracy in East Asia, I'm an optimist. Uh, and that's partly because when I was 15 years old, it was 1996, I discovered this thing called the World Wide Web and I told my teachers, I was like first year in junior high, back then that OIC, oh, that the future of human knowledge is being created on the web and all my textbooks or 10 years out of date. So I convinced my teachers that I want to drop out of high school and uh, start a, a, you know, some startup uh, on the World Web and make knowledge together. And surprisingly, they all agreed with me. Uh, and so, which is why I put so much optimism on bureaucracy and their ability to adapt. Uh, but in any case, uh, I discovered this wonderful community called the Internet Society, the ITF, the ICANN, the people who still run the internet, the core of the internet, still today. And so today, as I was for digital minister for two years now, I'm applying the practice that I learned when I was 15 years old, that is to say radical transparency, uh, location independence, uh, voluntary association uh, for the digital transformation of Taiwan is presently it's working and it's changing our country. And so I'll just start with a very brief like uh, 10 minute uh, conversation about the Social Innovation Lab and the uh, GovZero community's work uh, in shaping the Social Innovation Lab. And so this is literally what you would see when you turn around the Social Innovation Lab um, it is co-created, as I mentioned, by many social entrepreneurs. So these 
these soccer fields were drawn with people with Down syndromes. Uh, turns out they're excellent visual artists. Uh, and you also see those self-driving tricycles uh, roaming around. And these are um, uh, a collaborative project with MIT Media Lab. Uh, these are called Persuasive Electric Vehicles, or PEVs. They're very slow, and if they run into buildings or people, they harm no one. And so uh, we think of AI and autonomous vehicles as not something that's larger than us, but actually just like pets, you know, so that we can co-domesticate these uh, open innovation devices because it's all open source. So if you don't like uh, how it flashes red when it feels that, that it doesn't understand the situation, you can change it to the face of the cat or something like that. And people have actually um, built a lot of useful user experiences using co-creative methodologies. And in this space, which opens until 11 p.m. Uh, every day, um, people ask for a chef, for a resident chef and kitchen and things like that, and me personally. I'm here every uh, Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. is my office hour, so everybody can talk to me uh, like uh, directly. And so, um, and all, all these um, social fabric to, to collaborative governance is because we want to uh, um, solve a problem of a non-collaborative governance that plagued the um, public administration um, as of the, this century. Uh, because uh, in the old bad days, uh, people with different interests talk to different ministers or different uh, counselors, and like one not maybe the Ministry of Economy and the other not maybe the Environmental Protection Agency or something like that. And then the line in between the career public service is kind of invisible, but they uh, have to arbitrate and also uh, make decisions. But this kind of, of decision making is uh, broken now in this century because first, people don't need um, ministers to organize, right, with the right hashtag. Tens of thousands of people just show up randomly from nowhere. Uh, and then uh, for all the emergent issues, like autonomous vehicles and so on, we cannot have one council for each new emergent issue. It doesn't just doesn't work. And so because of this, uh, we uh, took a page from the internet governance and asked a different set of questions. Instead of asking who are going to organize these people and also how to arbitrate, we ask instead, given our very different positions, are there some common values that's important for everyone? And given the common values and common visions, is there innovations that people can deliver that can uh, make things better for everyone without leaving everyone, anyone behind? And just by keep asking those two questions, we've uh, created a co-creative uh, environment. And so that brings uh, to the GovZero idea of forking the government. Now, the word fork has a uh, meaning uh, in computer science and collaborative development that very simply put is taking something that's already there, going into one direction, and keeping what's there, not destroying it, but taking it into another direction, kind of like alternative uh, experiment. So in Taiwan, the GovZero community, which is the largest civic tech community in Asia, um, basically systematically look at any part of government that they don't look uh, like useful to people, which all ends in gov.tw anyway, right? So the legislative, for example, is legislative gov.tw, and for example, the budget, right? And so on, right? So it's all government service websites. And then the community just changed the O to a zero. And that's it. So you don't have to you know, pay for advertisement or run Facebook pages or do anything like that. Just with this single domain name hack for each government service, you just change it O to a zero and you get into the shadow government that is built by the open source community. Uh, and so the best thing is that uh, the uh, community also relinquished most of our copyright. So by the next procurement cycle, if the government likes it, the government would just merge it back. So each fork is kind of like a standby solution uh, for people to merge it back. Like this is the inaugural Gap Zero um, project, which is the visualization of the national budget. Uh, so you can click into each uh, single item and uh, comment on it and have a real conversation. And this one has already been merged not only to municipalities uh, a couple years back, but also so as of this year, all the 1,300 uh, ministerial projects are visualized on the join.gov.tw, which is our merging pack of the Gov Zero community's contributions, so that if you have anything to ask about any project whatsoever, it's budget, KPI, spending, procurement, anything, uh, you just come in publicly, and the Career Public Service just answers to you directly. And so this is a prototype built by the CPK community that's then incorporated back to the Gov Tech community. But after a few digital services that's being done this way, people started to get more ambitious and think maybe uh, we can do the same but with regulations and laws 
So it's not just websites, but also actual regulations and laws. For example, if you want to uh, wrap up those self-driving tricycles into actual cars and drones and whatever, then you will run into limitation restrictions that is put by the current laws on transportation and so on. And so we have a one-stop shop, sandbox.org.tw, that you can just go to and say, you know, our current regulation or and or law is currently blocking this wonderful idea that will uh, solve a social problem or environmental problem. And then people, uh, this is not uh, intriguing or lobbying because it's all open innovation anyway, uh, will uh, basically show you to one of those uh, back ends. Uh, for example, the National Development Council handles platform economy. So if you want to do something like Uber or Airbnb or sharing your private parking space and so on, they will do the uh, sandbox for you. Uh, for fintech, of course, like AI-based banking and things like that, there's the fintech sandbox. And the uh, UB, of course, uh, belongs to the um, economy affairs uh, ministry. And all of these share the same concept. Uh, you get a year to break the law. You get a year to break the law to introduce something that you think are for the social good or you identify a social need and satisfy it with this hybrid vehicles that drives and flies or something like that because it's all the same for the Ministry of Economy. Uh, in any case, um, you get one year to try it out and, and in a way that is uh, collaborative, that shares the data with the municipalities or the regions and so on. And at any point, if people are not comfortable with it, we run multi stakeholder consultations. Uh, but if people are happy with it, you can expand the scope for another year and so on, and if it's a good idea, then it gets merged back into new regulation. And if it's a law change, then of course the MPs have to deliberate to up to four years, but after the deliberation, it would then get merged back into our continental law system. And so this really works. And if things don't work out, uh, at least everybody learns something. We thank the investor for paying the tuitions for everybody. Since the data is shared, the lesson is shared, the next innovation will try a different angle. So this is the idea of a regulatory co-creation. But how do we say it actually addresses a local need? So as I mentioned every Wednesday, I'm in the social innovation lab for people to talk to. But every other Tuesday, I tour around all the rural indigenous and all those um, you know, underserved uh, regions in Taiwan and have a real time conversation I stay for a day or so with the local social innovators. So this is why in, and even more remote areas like Taidong can teleconference in. But whenever I do that, all the 12 ministry that I mentioned uh, with their participation officers, they are actually in the social innovation lab enjoying pretty good food and in a relaxed mood, but also seeing what I am seeing in those uh, local and rural areas. And so any issues that's brought up must be resolved by those uh, officers uh, within two weeks. Or they say, you know, we, this is a structural problem, we can't solve that, which then the sandbox experimenters can point to that and say, okay, so we have the rationale to break the regulation and our law because you have admitted that you don't have a structural uh, solution to this local problem. And so this is our regional innovation system. And so uh, before each um, and, and crew vehicles or things like that are, of course, uh, released to the wild, so to speak, uh, there are also closed simulation sites like a zoo for everybody to visit uh, and to uh, do real-time conversation. So that brings to the final question, like after a year of experimentation, how do we actually determine whether this is a good idea or not, right? How do we run consultations that scales to tens of thousands of people? And we also use AI-powered conversation for that. So this is a piece of open source technology called Polis, and it basically shows your avatar among your Facebook and Twitter and other friends of how people feel, react, after uh, having some first-hand experience. This particular one was in 2015 when Uber entered Taiwan, people clustered into different groups. And so after a year of experimentation, we have a lot of data. It's community owned. Everybody can inspect the same open data, not just open government data, but also open citizen data. And so we ask people, how do you feel about it? And that's the key part of the conversation. Because if people just brainstorm ideas without checking on each other's feelings, they tend to be polarized. But if we allocate a month or so for people's feelings, then the best ideas are the ones that address most people's feelings. And then we can rectify and or ratify those ideas into laws. And so for example, for our uh, in UV. Uh, here maybe your avatar, you see a fellow sentiment from your fellow citizen, you can click agree or disagree and then your avatar will move among the people that you know and like. You just didn't talk about this over dinner. Uh, and so, uh, and it's impossible to make ad hominem attacks and or uh, disrupting the conversation because there is no reply button. 
Uh, so um, nobody can paste cat pictures or things like that. Uh, if you see a few you know, yes or no questions, and then you can share your own authentic feelings for other people to vote on. And after a period of three weeks or four weeks, we always see a shape like this. This is a um, experiment we did in Bowling Green in the US. Uh, like people agree to disagree on a few key things that uh, actually takes everybody's attention on mainstream media and creates uh, the perception that people are polarized, but people really aren't. Uh, people spend m far more time to refine the consensus, their common feelings around the things that people feel are important. And so because we design the social fabric in this way, uh, people can always arrive to consensus statements, which we then uh, take it into a binding agenda for those different stakeholders to innovate on, saying this is what people commonly feel like, and do you have innovation to address all of it. And so during our regional tours, we see a lot of things that people care about that the government doesn't yet have allocated resources resources to, and once we admit that we don't have resources yet, uh, we see the Gov Zero people stepping in. For example, this is a Gov Zero air pollution visualization map. There's more than 2,000 sites all around Taiwan, just installing very cheap air quality sensors, uh, and it's very easy to measure it in your balcony, in your school, and things like that, but it's not just for your uh, vicinity, it actually uploads uh, to a blockchain, uh, actually to a distributed ledger uh, called IOTA, uh, and so it keeps everybody honest, and um, it, it makes it possible for people to aggregate those data into the supercomputing center, and also shows the, basically, at one glance, you can see the digital divide of Taiwan, <laughs> and, and and then uh, the government can then uh, allocate more um, environmental stations in places where there's less citizen scientists, or if the citizen scientists feel that they really want, like here, uh, to have a, a station, it's impossible for them to fly a drone uh, 24 hours a day, but we can because we have, the government has uh, wind uh, offshore wind turbine, um, you know, electric generator towers, and so we're saying, okay, we're now installing those civic tech pieces on those electric uh, generators. And because it's all open source, it's all open innovation anyway. Anybody who has Arduino, Raspberry Pi, or anything like that can download it off the internet and download the uh, source code. You can change it, but if you don't change it, it uh, by default upload to the Taiwan network. And so we have this uh, open innovation network that aggregates a lot of uh, data, and we have one particular. Uh, website for it is in English and in Mandarin as well, the collective intelligence.taiwan.gov.tw uh, that collects web intelligence about uh, air quality, water quality, and all sort of meteorological data as well. And we have one web presence for collective intelligence, for SI, social innovation, for AI, for smart Taiwan, for bio Taiwan, and so on. And these are like one-stop shops also for our national strategies working with people. And so uh, in conclusion, I would like to say uh, the main idea of doing this in urban innovation is to make sure that the people can see that the economic, social, and environmental needs are not always at odds at each other. If we make use of the digital um, technology as well, which is the 17th in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, I always say that my work as digital minister is just on 1718, which is reliable data from everybody. 1717, making sure that using the same data, we can arrive in a place where we can share authentic feelings. And 1716, to make sure that innovations, as a result of sharing those feelings, are open by default so that people around the world can use it in a non colonizing <laughs> manner, but co creating manner. And so, this is the main message, which is global goals and Taiwan can help. And then finally, <laughs> I would like to read you um, a poem because when I joined the cabinet two years ago, I didn't have a contract. I had a public ask me anything uh, period for one month and I had a compact uh, with the government. So I always said that I'm with working with the cabinet, not working for the cabinet, and be because of radical transparency, voluntary association, and location independence. So when they asked me for a job description, uh, I wrote them a poem instead, which to me kind of um, shows what tech for good means and shows how do we migrate from a traditional IT mindset to a more digital uh, mindset. So I'm going just to read the poem, which is my job description. Um, when we see the Internet of Things, Let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you so much.
way. Yes, uh, you have to catch your mic. Okay, this is really fun. Can you catch? Okay. <laughs> Uh, great talk, thank you very much for sharing. Um, just wanted to get a bit more clarity around the forking. So when you fork the government website, do you actually fork that and then do like merge it? How does that work? Is that like a meeting process where you go and talk to the government and say here it is, or is it using the internet? Yeah, that's a great question. So this domain name uh, is not reserved by the government. It's registered by the civil society. And just last week, gov Italy uh, gets formed. So if you go to budget.g0v.it, you see the counterpart in Italy. And then, so the, the basic idea is that this is just a meme. Uh, it's not a trademark. It's not a patent or anything like that. This is just a way to easily discover alternatives to the public service. But once people uh, see that this has cashed on, like the air um, quality measurement thing, EMV, G0V, the TDOP has caught on, naturally the, the public service will be interested. And then they will also attend the bi-monthly hackathons uh, as individuals in the individual capacity. So more often than not, we find in the list of contributors uh, also actually frontline civil service people working in their individual capacity. So there's many people like wearing two hats uh, because they either don't get the political will or the budget or cross silo you know, communication in their line of work. So they go to the civic tech community uh, to approve a concept and uh, ask for it to be merged back, which then um, very much simplify their own work. And so in Taiwan, we have an annual presidential social innovation hackathon. And it is kind of an abuse of the term hackathon because it's three months long. It's not two days. <laughs> but it's a three months long process of like three weekends and uh, one uh, demo. And basically, it's more than 100 different proposals. And then we match the proposals, like the Taiwan Water Corporation donates uh, their uh, water pressure and water flow sensors because they want to detect leakage faster. And the machine learning uh, expertise who came uh, to contribute. Basically, there is no award <coughs> money for the Presidential Social Innovation Hackathon. Uh, the award is twofold. First, the President's office was, will be your PM office. So there's no data that you cannot get. <laughs> there's no political will problem because the pre President herself will be your PM. And the second thing is that for the ones that win the award, the, the top five, there's a guarantee to merge it back into the public service uh, for the next budget year. And so this is basically maximizing the impact. And we see many presidential hackathon uh, being proposed by the civic tech community, but it's written by someone in the public service. So it's a very interesting dynamic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fernando. I'm actually the CEO of a company that uh, we provide consulting on blockchain with the uh, government and civic governments. Awesome. Looking at uh, the scenario that you are providing here, that actually regulatory and non-regulated uh, market, I uh, wonder if you are adopting the idea to put a blockchain platform across all the spectrum of the government, right? To have a specifically more transparency and uh, obviously more regulatory uh, opportunity for that. Yeah, very much so. Uh, we use distributed ledgers as a kind of externally auditable <coughs> distributed databases. Uh, so, like, not cryptocurrency, but ledgers, right? And, and we, we use that for pretty much everything, uh, exactly as you said. And so, uh, yeah, I think it is one of those things that we're creating a digital double, a digital twin. Uh, as I mentioned, the main use case is that because the civil society organizations don't necessarily trust the government, uh, to not change their numbers. Uh, so if you really want to have open data that's not just open government data, but also open private sector and open uh, social sector data, you really have to have something like a distributed ledger to keep everybody honest. So I totally agree with your uh, position. Hi. <clears throat> My name is John McDonald. Uh, welcome back to Toronto. Um, how do you manage to avoid anybody gaming the voting and the mm -hmm. presentation, mm -hmm. setting up bots, mm -hmm. and so yeah. on. So yeah, what's our troll control strategy? Um, so very carefully. So um, two things, right? In our national e-petition system, you have to have a SMS number, and then you have to have an email uh, box. So it's kind of hard to get you know a large amount of SMS numbers without people noticing. But people can participate pseudonymously as well because there may be power imbalances involved. And so uh, that is the uh, the thing. And also, once you are here, actually we don't look at the numbers. In the groups. So if you mobilize 5,000 people, each react in exactly the same way, bot or not, um, actually it doesn't mean anything because this measures the diversity 
have feelings. It doesn't mean uh, it's not dirty at all. This is basically to try to come up with things that resonates with everybody. And so this cannot really be automated. Uh, if you, of course, have an uh, AI algorithm that can generate sentiments that resonate with everybody, then I, for one, welcome our new overlords. But so far, that has not happened <laughs> to, to resonate with everybody's feelings. That really takes a human uh, authentic experience to do. Um, and so that's both for the authentication and also for the tallying part. Well, uh, two points. Number one, this seems to eliminate the lobbyist. Mm -hmm and the so-called corridors of power mm -hmm. that we still have here. Mm -hmm. And uh, number two, I'm curious if you, how does this compare with what's going on in Estonia? Mm -hmm. We also have an uh, experiment in, uh, you seem to, mm -hmm. okay, so if you want to comment on that. Oh yeah, I think Estonia is particularly interesting because uh, their uh, governance system is set up after the internet. Right, so there is no legacy <laughs> to speak of. Uh, while in Taiwan, we started with a paper-based um, governance system. So we have to build digital twins, we have to slowly migrate people, we have to introduce the use of stylus over the place because people are used to, to pencils <laughs> and things like that. So we have a much more uh, longer migration path compared to Estonia, but uh, we also think that this means that our innovations are more equally applicable all around the world. Uh, because many places, just like in Canada, there are also you know a paper trail or people's love with paper-based processes, <laughs> and that is why uh, this kind of uh, dual um, mode uh, is, I think, is particularly interesting and useful. But we do look to Estonia, and we were um, sharing a lot of uh, technologies operation with the Digital Seven uh, groups uh, because we are all committed to open source everything we use. So, for example, the upvote and downvote system, and so on. That's actually an Icelandic uh, contribution. We took it from Veterik Kavik. And so there is an active network of people collaborating going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, my name is Anna. And first of all, when you mentioned the word Pascal for the language, I was surprised because that's the first language I learned back in Armenia University. Mm. And I came here and nobody actually knows what it is. So um, it's a beautiful language and I'd like to understand what you did to revive it. Um, secondly, this is amazing and I just don't know how we can do the same in North America. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we're, we're holding a two-day workshop, actually. The workshop is going on right now. <laughs> uh, and we have people uh, from the city government, from the Ontario government, and as well as from the CSOs. Uh, and it's about 30 people, and uh, people started sitting next to the people they know. And in the very first thing we did in the workshop was to maximize strangerness. Like, if you know anybody from your table, move your position so that they can properly mingle. Uh, because really, it takes cross-sectoral trust for something like this to happen, uh, because otherwise, if one size legitimacy is too high, it actually disincentivizes everybody else uh, from participating. So this cross-sectoral trust is the social fabric that enables this kind of co-creation. And that is the kind of thing that we're trying to foster with our workshop here. We also did a workshop in NYC for, uh, with the same dynamic. And the Pascal, do you want to say anything about Pascal? It's probably not my code. Yeah, yeah, well, no. But uh, actually, it's, it, it's Haskell, but, but, I, but I write uh, Pascal as well, they'll find it. Like yeah. Um, okay, so how about we, uh, I'll come back and get that. Um, we'll be, Alex, if you can go up and maybe just say, introduce yourself and say a few words and tell us your values. Yeah, that's all right. So, yeah, take the mic. Thanks very much. Well, that's a hard act to follow. Great. <laughs> that's a fantastic way. Um, so I'm uh, VP of Solutions Lab here at Mars. I run a social innovation lab called the Mars Solutions Lab. And um, maybe to start with my values. Um, yeah, so I think uh, what drives me is um, I think that to, um, for us to make progress as a society, um, we need to be better at solving complex problems. Um, I think that, the, that actually the, the um, future of humanity rests on our ability to be able to solve complex problems together. Um, and I think the two problems of our time that are, are of interest to me are climate change um, and growing inequality and income polarization. So I think that those are two of the big issues, but um, they are part of the sustainable development goals. And so for me, when I tie my own personal values around you know, 
of a sustainability for, for the future uh, and, and driving towards equality. Um, if I was to summarize that as a value, the word I would choose is flourishing. Mm. Flourishing. Flourishing. It's, wow. it's a sustainability to me has always seemed boring. It's always seemed dull. It's always seemed unesthetic. It's the kind of thing like I can't get excited about being sustainable. But when I think about flourishing, that's a value to me that I can get excited about, that I can share. And it's something that's very organic. Uh, we think of the planet flourishing, but we also think about people flourishing. We can think of it in a healthcare setting. We can think of it in a in an environmental setting. We can think of it in an economic setting. And so it really brings us to that that triple bottom line kind of perspective. Flourishing goals. Flourishing goals. Yeah, that could be the next level of of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Could be the the UN Flourishing Goals. Um, so that's that's a bit about my values and where I come from. Um, so yeah, I've been doing this work um, for, for a few years now. Um, I've, I moved to Canada five years ago to set up the first social innovation lab uh, inside a, a provincial government here. Uh, and that was the government of Alberta. Um, so I moved to Edmonton, not for the weather. Um, it's snowing there today. <laughs> and uh, probably headed towards minus 30. Um, but I moved there because the government was in a very interesting place where they were, um, as you may have heard, there were a few headlines around Keystone XL, the pipelines, uh, trying to get oil sands uh, to market. And um, all of a sudden they started getting these protests. They started getting uh, people, um, Hollywood celebrities, talking about Alberta and the oil sands and the great stain it was and, and, uh, and so forth. And so all of a sudden this oil and gas development, which had powered the economy for the last 50 years, was being called into question and they were losing social license. Uh, and so um, the, it was a point where the dominant success myths of the, of the province uh, and its economy were being called into question. Uh, and so I did some, a few workshops with the government and then they asked me to set up a lab inside of government. Uh, and so this lab was focused on how does a province like <laughs> Alberta maintain its competitiveness uh, in a transition towards a low carbon economy. So it's a pretty tough challenge to solve uh, and, and oil and gas energy touched on everything in the province. It was, it was all of the social challenges, it was all the First Nations challenges, it was healthcare, it touched all parts of the system. And so when I, when I moved to Alberta, uh, nobody knew what a social innovation lab was. Nobody knew what systemic design, the type of method we were using, was, was all about. Uh, and so we took kind of a show don't tell approach where it's like rather than explain this to people, let's just start doing it. And so in our first year we ran 38 projects across 13 different ministries of government. We engaged citizens in the policy making process. And basically our, our goal was to engage more more perspectives and more of the complexity of issues and do it faster than the traditional policy development cycle. Uh, and so that was kind of where we started. Um, as we, um, as we uh, iterated from that and learned from, from these, these rapid um, policy sprints, um, we started to deepen our expertise around specifically the natural resource management sector and the energy sector. Uh, and we formed a partnership with a social innovation lab that was outside of government called the Energy Futures Lab. Uh, because we found that doing this work from inside of government was, uh, was very frustrating. Um, it was the kind of work where you push the boulder up the hill and the boulder rolls down on top of you every morning. Uh, and it was the, the kind of work where it just felt like 90% of your energy, your creative energy, was going into overcoming the bureaucracy rather than doing the innovative work that you really wanted to do. Um, and so what we did was when we found an alliance with an outside of government social innovation lab, we found that we had access to the levers of power and the policy um, that they didn't have, and they had the space to take risk and experiment and do things that the bureaucracy was, un was unable to do. And so we found this, this kind of partnership and it was a very successful partnership in doing this kind of social innovation work. Uh, and over the course of four years, we ran 100 different projects across all ministries, did health healthcare system transformation, um, reforming family justice system, uh, and helping Alberta to diversify its economy beyond the oil and gas. 
Um, so then I moved to Mars and I've been here for about 15 months now uh, running the Solutions Lab. Uh, and we are working on some projects uh, in social innovation to do some cross-sectoral type of, type of change. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of the kind of projects that we work on. Um, number one, we're working to get 40,000 youth into employment across Canada in the next five years. This is called Opportunity for All Youth. Um, and while government has been part of this, this, uh, this particular program with uh, ESTC, um, Employment and Social Development Canada, um, this has actually been driven by the corporate sector. This is something that Starbucks has been doing um, for about 13 years, but at a very small scale. They realized that um, when they could hire a youth that has faced one or more barriers to employment, that hiring that youth actually gave them a better return on investment than their other hiring channels. Um, why is that? Because the kind of youth that maybe uh, are not in school and they're not in a job, um, they have a form of resiliency um, that the Silver Spoon kids maybe don't have, uh, that have had all of the benefits handed to them in life. They also have a loyalty to the company that when, when you're uh, in a situation of feeling like you have no hope, uh, and somebody gives you a career opportunity, um, that's, that's pretty amazing. And, and so they found that they, uh, they've gotten some loyalty from that. And so what we've been doing is working to expand this across a coalition of forward-leaning employers who are doing this not out of corporate social responsibility to, to kind of do some public benefit. It's not, it's not philanthropy. This is them hiring to meet a hiring need, because they can't get the, 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 the talent that they need. Um, and we're getting them 85% acceptance rates from, from the youth, and they're sticking around longer. Uh, and so it's actually having a positive p &L benefit at the same time as it is solving an important social problem. Um, so that's an example of the kind of work we do. Uh, a very different kind of project, we were asked to come into the city of Edmonton. Um, where there was uh, this, this kind of polarization you talked about in the conversation. Um, safe injection sites being set up, all three set up in Chinatown. So <coughs> Chinatown was furious about this because there wasn't consultation. They, um, they started to sue the government. Uh, and so the city is being sued by the, by the citizens. The service agencies are also frustrated with the city and the citizens are frustrated with the service agencies because um, they feel like their suburbs are being ghettoized by the, by the concentration of services for people who are on the streets, who are homeless, me having mental health and addiction challenges. Um, there were proposals to build a large, um, a, a large wellness centre to make life better for, uh, for the people um, who, are, who are street involved. But when we actually went out and hung out on the streets and spoke with these people, the new shiny building would solve exactly none of their needs. So we've got multiple levels of government that don't trust each other. We've got citizens who are angry at the government. We've got the, the, the agencies lost the trust of the, of the population they're part of. And we asked to run them through a social innovation process. Uh, and that started with deep ethnography, which is really just a fancy word for hanging out and getting to know people. Uh, and getting to figure out what their hopes and dreams are, what's their motivations, what do they care about, what do they want. Uh, and then we share that information with government officials, but with people with lived experience of homelessness, uh, and with people who are, um, who are um, working to help those, those communities. Uh, and as we brought them around and shared this new data and new information with them, uh, we were able to really pinpoint very specific kind of acupuncture points where a small change, a small prototype, a small intervention could achieve a big result. Uh, and so we ran 14 of these prototypes in parallel, um, and one of them was called Project Welcome Map. Mm. We took um, Boyle Street Community Services, which was one of the, the homeless shelters, um, old banana packing factory from the 1950s, and we, um, it, outside was this huge expanse of concrete where all of the homeless people would gather when they got kicked out at 6.30 in the morning. And it was right next to the brand new Oilers Stadium downtown. So when people are going to the game, you would see them walk down the street and they would kind of, there's a, a crosswalk here, they would go down and they would jaywalk to avoid this place where all the homeless people are hanging out. 
Um, and it was also an area where the police would come by frequently for, for drug use and for violence. And so we took that and we entered into a co-design with the folks, the community members that hang out there. And we asked them what they want and we asked them what, what could we do here. And we brought in some indigenous artists and for $300 worth of paint, some borrowed furniture, some, uh, some plants, we completely transformed this space. Uh, and it was a co-design, co-production, uh, where the, the, the street involved folks were actually felt ownership of, of what happened because they got to, to decide it. Uh, and as they did that work, um, people noticed that kids were coming out to play here because there were giant Lego blocks. Uh, when kids are playing, <coughs> nobody's going to be violent and doing drugs. Um, the seating lowered the temperature. People were now relaxed. There was an abundance of seating rather than just the one seat that everyone used to fight over. There were umbrellas to keep people shade uh, in the sun. So it just created a completely dis different atmosphere. It was colorful, it was inviting. Um, and people from the city started coming in and figuring out what's going on here. We started to build bridges across the community. So an example of a different kind of social innovation project we've done. So that's enough from me. Um, we want to hear more about you and your, your amazing experiences. But that's some of the social innovation lab work that's happening here in Canada. I don't have as long a speech prepared. Um, I want to compliment you, Audrey, on your well-constructed URLs. You're, you're, you're nice to see. And it probably helped the government have those kind of well-constructed URLs as well, because you can do that parallel, go zero. Um, I just wanted to start today. So I'm Charles. Um, uh, we were talking about values. Uh, I sort of had my career about, in 2005, I was doing my PhD, which I didn't finish. And, um, but at that time, I was also at U of T, I was heading up a project called Project Open Source Open Access. And I was very involved in a lot of the camp community and the, the uh, sort of open side of things. Um, I left my PhD and I kind of joined the corporate world and I built a career around sort of driving digital transformation inside organizations. And so, I found myself on planes going to New York and London and working for big Fortune 500 clients or being employed by a big Fortune 500 company, uh, which was amazing. And I had a lot of great experiences and worked with some really great people. But five years ago, I kind of realized that I had lost something along the way. And I had kind of forgotten. Most of my life has been around design, uh, sort of the intersection of design, technology, and sort of urbanism and civics. And I had kind of lost the urbanism civics side of things along the way. And so I decided to change and I ended up coming here to work at Mars, which was uh, very transformative for me and I met so many also really amazing people in the community here. Uh, but I also at that time started a, a new uh, nonprofit at that time called Urban Digital. And the, the purpose of Urban Digital was to bring what we had seen, uh, it was with Gabe Sani and a few others, uh, we had seen sort of the community of urbanists, uh, the planners, the activists, the social workers, uh, were very disconnected from the tech community. That there was sort of at that time the burgeoning tech community here in Toronto. Uh, and those two, uh, the, the urbanists didn't seem to know much about technology, and the technologists didn't seem to really be connected with the ways in which cities were designed. And we could see this tsunami of change that was coming with smart cities and data and technology that was coming into our cities, the internet of things. So we started this nonprofit, which was you know, very small and underfunded, and we, both, so we basically just did events and meetups. We, we wanted to build community. That was the purpose of the nonprofit. And uh, so we ended up actually, well, we held an event right here in this room, actually called in 2013, called the uh, Urban Mobility Futures. And we, had, we had Lyft here, and we had, uh, uh, we had Cardigo here. Uber was not here yet. Uh, we had uh, a number of other people from the TTC, and we were talking about transit, which is actually a funny thing now, given where we've gone with, with Urban Digital. But. So that went on for a while. We built a really good community there, but we realized that actually where our, our efforts should be focused was more on the civic side. We saw what was happening globally uh, with Smart Chicago and Code for America and, and uh, the, you know, My Society and uh, the UK. So there were a lot of changes happening 
around the way that citizens and residents were engaging with their governments, the way that governments were trying to uh, grapple with the rapid technology change and that um, citizens and residents were used to actually having amazing uh, digital experiences with banking and music and then they go and renew their driver's license and it was a terrible experience. They would fax things in or it was very analog. So we, we started to look at what could we do in this space and so we, we pivoted uh, and we started something called Code for Canada. So a year and a half ago uh, we started Code for Canada which is part of the global Code for All movement. There's Code for Alls in Taiwan, uh, in Japan, in Germany, in Nigeria, in Pakistan, in the United States. Uh, everyone. Uh, it's a part of the sort of global civic tech movement. And they, uh, what we're looking at was how could we bring uh, citizens together with government and the community and the technology and design and policy community to create a space where, uh, you, along the philosophy of building uh, with, not for. So it's actually coming out of the sort of 19th century model that we have for government, which is very machine based and binary based. and Governments need to produce services at scale for citizens, and citizens are treated like consumers. Governments producer, citizens are consumers. Can we can we build some things that uh, allow uh, citizens to co-design, uh, to co-produce with government? So uh, we uh, we started a group here in Toronto called Civic Tech Toronto, which uh, uh, met every Tuesday night in Hack, hack Nights, and so people would and you know people say, well, are people getting paid to do this stuff? No. But volunteers would come out every Tuesday night, we're up to like 60 to 100 every Tuesday night now, uh, to work on projects on an ongoing basis. And these projects were things like Budgetpedia, which would help um, help citizens and residents understand uh, the way that the, the uh, city budget is created, using that data and actually creating tools to allow people to interpret the budget a little better. Access to justice, which allows newcomers and others to navigate the justice system that's often done in very government silos, it's very difficult for a newcomer to, to uh, navigate. So projects like that. Uh, we started Code for Canada as a national nonprofit, so we have uh, a number of programs. Our, our, our sort of big flagship program is called the Fellowship Program, so we embed, uh, we embed teams, a product owner, a UX designer, and a coder as a team in a scoped out project with a government partner to actually help the government design a better experience for their residents and their citizens. And we've, we've gone through our first cohort that just graduated in the summer. Uh, an example of one of the projects we worked on was with uh, Veteran Affairs Canada. And basically, if you looked at the, uh, if you're a veteran, uh, you're, you're, uh, you qualify for a number of benefits. And uh, you really don't, uh, when, you, when you were looking at, we were looking at the map of all the different uh, benefits that veterans would have. It's a labyrinth of spider web, spiders web. The veterans were really having a hard time navigating and understanding what things that they actually qualified to get and what they were. So the Code for Canada Fellowship team, working in partnership with Veteran Affairs, built a kind of portal, uh, but actually showed all the different benefits that they would have, but tested the names of the, the benefits were tested with veterans themselves, both in French and in English, uh, so that they were, in a way that they would understand, not to talk down to benefits, I'll admit to the veterans. In many cases, the language was very bureaucratic and impenetrable to anybody, uh, to make it simpler and easier to understand, so they could understand the benefits that they were uh, entitled to get as a veteran. Uh, so that's an example of one of the projects we've got. We now have, so we have, uh, we've had and have fellowship programs with the government of Canada, with the government of Ontario, and the city of Toronto. So. That's, that's our flagship program, and we're getting great interest across the country. It's a way in which you can help governments, as you, as you may understand, any large organization, just not governments, struggle with the new technologies because they have, you know, they have layers and layers of legacy technology processes. And uh, in many cases, sort of cutting edge designers and coders don't necessarily work for the government. So this gives them a way for teams to kind of work it, not as a vendor, but, and not as an employee but actually as an embedded team over a 10 month period to work on a scoped out project and help maybe create some culture change inside the government at the same time. The other, um, the other pillars that we have, so there, there are now civic tech communities across the country, uh, from Halifax to Vancouver, to Yellowknife, uh, including Edmonton. And, uh, and so Code for Canada helps connect those communities together. We built like a civic tech playbook to uh, toolkit, I guess, to help uh, either help those those communities grow or help people in other communities start up a civic tech. 
uh, program. So that's another uh, program that we've done. We've also launched Civic Hall, which is, there's a Civic Hall in New York. It's not exactly the same. Uh, the Civic Hall in Toronto is focused on municipal governments mostly, uh, and they work on small uh, workshops and small projects. Uh, and there's a membership model where uh, the City of Toronto members and others, uh, Mark and is also participating, can have uh, can get a membership in Civic Hall and have a hot desk. Uh, it's actually hosted at CSI right now. Um, so that's another program that we've launched. And finally, uh, the last thing we've launched is Canada's first civic user testing group. So a lot of uh, government services, when you're rolling out how to renew your driver's license, how to qualify for uh, you know payments or whatever else you may get, it, um, they're not often user tested or they're not tested very well. Or if they are, they're often done through professional uh, user testing groups. And those groups are usually not very representative of the population and uh, and so the civic user testing group is is new it was just launched uh, in, in september um, and it's a way of actually having citizens who actually get paid to participate uh, but it's a, a diverse set of users in in some cases priority communities uh, to allow them to participate in the co-design of government and public services so that's another thing uh, so to return to values um, I, I feel uh, like I've con gone on this journey, and so now I'm much more focused. I still have a corporate job, uh, but my corporate job is with an engineering and architecture and planning firm. We're trying to make cities more livable and better. So, uh, so I've come full circle, and my values really are around sustainability, resilience, openness. And then I think about all the best leaders who I've, all, who I've ever met, and they're always, to your point, they're always relentlessly optimistic. So that optimism, not to be accused, of, not to be uh, confused with naivete, relentless optimism uh, is what we really need right now. I think we need a lot more of that. Uh, so that's one of the values I try to hold for my team. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Thank you. Um, are there any questions for Charles? Yeah. You ready? <laughs> No, they're silly, aren't they? Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I've been following what you've been doing for Code for Canada. Very interesting. I went to some events. I saw you at the Open House. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. Um, I have a question about, um, I was thinking about one of the obstacles you might be faced with with the fellowship program is um, managing confidentiality of information. Has that come up with the government? Like, you know, having these people who are embedded for a short time, mm -hmm. How, how have you managed that part? The, uh, they, they, are, they do sign agreements when they join in as part of the yeah. sort of agreement that we have with the government. So it's like any other relationship that you have uh, with, uh, you know, with another entity is that they, they do sign agreements around being, you know, as to your point, uh, the, the information about our about citizens, for example, our veterans. Uh, need to be protected and not to be shared. So all of, all of the uh, all of the fellows do sign those agreements before entering into the relationship. Okay. Thank you. Can you throw it to the back? I can try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 uh, I'm just curious, I've been a UX researcher for about seven years and I was watching and following the Sidewalk Labs initiative because I'm into IoT now. I'm just curious, you mentioned this uh, civic user group. Is that something that people self-select in? Do you recruit? Is there an outreach? I'm just curious how that works. Yeah, it's actually just started. Okay. So I think we're still figuring that out, how we're going to actually, we are, we, we are recruiting people, so we will recruit people. Yep. Uh, but we have to, part of the value of it is that it's representative and it's that it, you get a, a Part of the value of this is that you're going to get uh, people testing that normally we never test. So we, we're going to be doing outreach as well. That's, that's, that's awesome. It's the hardest part of, of research is finding the right people. Yeah. Anybody else before we? Yes. One more question right here, please. Yeah, I understand your mobile device <coughs> to IPI group. IPI. I, I'm, uh, I'm the head of uh, okay, communications um, for that. Yeah, I'm maybe in price, okay, and by the IPI uh, setup. And uh, can you elaborate a bit how IPI groups sort of promote more like a design, urban sort of, sort of <coughs> technology field into some sort of stakeholder of the industry? That's why I like that idea. So I, yeah. myself, no, I'm saying 
can you elaborate, elaborate a little bit about the structure, the, the goal, how IBI set to more like a promote, ele elevate the design industry into more like a stakeholder of the society? Uh, how do they promote the design community? The yeah, how, how, they, how they structure, how the IPI oh, how do they, is how a structure which okay, well, do they so all these I, technology? IPI is design. a professional services firm. Um, so they, uh, they actually do run a number of citizen outreach and engagement programs, usually with, their, with our clients who are cities. So we, we've done them for the city of Calgary, we've done them for Toronto, uh, we've done them in the U.S. Um, so, uh, so we do we do do that citizen engagement piece as part of our consulting services that we provide. Yes. Okay, let's uh, let's yeah. go, Minister. We're we'll gonna call you up to sure. the panel, Alex Charles. If you would mind just taking right, a seat, sure. yeah. and uh, we'll look at some questions that we've got on the app. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. There's a theory that clustering of creative class to make coming few competitive and successful global cities fairly spiky. Is Taiwan as a de facto city-state well equipped to becoming a competitive creative city or state? Mm -hmm. I think that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would love to hear from the other two. <laughs> yeah, Taipei is interesting because um, geographically we're kind of small. From Taipei to the south most to Kaohsiung by high speed rails is just one hour and a half. Right? But it's also uh, 23 million people. Um, and so when we see um, you know, this kind of geography and when the president Tsai uh, says, you know, broadband is a human right. Uh, many people say that, right, but we actually deliver. So now in any place in Taiwan, including the remote or rural islands and things like that, if you don't have broadband access of at least 10 megabits per second, it's our fault. And so, and, and so this is this kind of geography really makes Taiwan city texting feel like like a larger municipality, uh, like a, a very very connected <coughs> city tech community, but also provides a, a large population of many layers, so like sixteen indigenous First Nations with its own cultures and all the different languages. By the end of the year, we'll pass the National Languages Act, so we'll have the twenty two national languages. So you can, um, you know, if a, uh, if a child want to learn calculus. In, in Sakilaya or in Amis or in something, uh, the Ministry of Education need to provide AI and other resources for, for the uh, students to actually learn that. So I think we're a extremely rich um, cultural layers, uh, and those cultural layers makes the creative classes not competitive, but rather, uh, as I mentioned, plurality. I think plurality is our own value, and uh, it's very easy to connect with other uh, cities and municipalities and nations that also values plurality and diversity of perspectives. Great. Um, yeah, so there's some great values here. Uh, freedom of speech, collaboration, plurality, agree to disagree, mm -hmm. fairness, transparency, um, co-opetition, mm -hmm. uh, equity, equality, generosity, innovation, hard work, fun, family, doing good for others. And one deeply philosophical person who wrote, why am I here? <laughs> um, uh, Smarsh, just one more question for you. Uh, I haven't heard you say this, but apparently someone is asking, why do you say you are the warm power of Taiwan? Mm. Well, yeah, um, I, I'm not saying I'm the warm power of Taiwan. Uh, I'm saying, you know, um, soft power, hard power, right? Uh, sharp power. Warm power. So <laughs> basically, uh, warm power is a shorthand that says Taiwan uh, solves our own social and environmental issues through co-creation and social innovation. And when we share those innovations, we always share it openly. That is to say, not in a colonizing manner, <laughs> but, but rather in a co-creative manner. Um, case in point, uh, I mentioned briefly on stage that the Taiwan Water Corporation, through the Presidential Social Innovation Hackathon, worked with machine learning researchers to reduce the water leakage uh, detection by tenfold. Now, because we SDG index that, like climate action and life underwater and things like that, uh, like all the presidential uh, hackathon items are SDG index, uh, people in Wellington in New Zealand uh, discovered that uh, work that we do uh, just by Googling, uh, and then they uh, said, you know, they 
didn't have a water shortage problem, but now because of the climate change, they actually do now. Uh, so their choice is between you know buying a proprietary Israeli solution that they may have to renew every year and it's not uh, co-created, or they could invite a presidential hackathon team from Taiwan to Wellington for three uh, months and co-create something together and based on open source uh, toolkits and technologies so they actually communally own that technology in their water pipeline. So that is the kind of one power we are proposing because when they increase the, the machine learning algorithms, Taiwan also benefit because it's open collaboration and everybody else on us can also see the collaboration happening in real time on GitHub and so on. And so it's to the benefit of the entire plan and not just for our two countries. And that is what we mean by one power. Great. Uh, any questions for the audience? I have a bunch, but if you have anything, please put up your hand or please um, send it on the app. So uh, the title of this is Tech for Good. So I'm really interested in a what is your favorite example of tech for good? Or it doesn't have to be your favorite, I won't put pressure on you, but a example of tech for good that you want to share with us. Yeah. Does anybody have one in mind? <laughs> Apparently <laughs> Alex has one in mind. I guess I do. Um, I don't know, I think, I think uh, a lot of the media these days you hear, um, the first thing you hear about tech is the, the, the fear and the concern, and I think that we're definitely seeing some case studies, Cambridge Analytica style, that, that mean those concerns are warranted. Um, but, but I do think it's uh, also uh, really important to follow some of the, the really positive applications of, of technology because technology is just a tool. Uh, I mean, we can either use it for evil um, or we can use it for good. And uh, often the first kind of case studies come out are uh, military and um, you know, on the internet, the first case case studies are usually porn. <laughs> but then, uh, but then after we think of kind of some of those ex examples, we often will third or fourth or fifth time we'll actually say, "Oh, this could actually be useful to do something really good." Um, so I think um, I, one one good example is um, the behaviour insights teams that have been running in the UK. Uh, I think they have been bringing uh, an evidence-based approach to policy making. Uh, which, which I think is very encouraging. Um, uh, rather than just putting policies out based on ideology, um, you, you use them to say, um, does this actually work? It's a pretty basic question, but it's one that's usually not asked in government. Um, and um, over the last few years, um, they've been making use of machine learning to augment their, their um, behavioral economics type approach. Um, and so they've done eight separate trials using um, using machine learning uh, to see if they can just use publicly open data sets uh, to help uh, improve government services. And one particular area that they've been um, been focusing in on is um, how government inspections. Government has to inspect a lot of a lot of different services uh, across across the, the country uh, in order to make sure that the public safety is upheld. Uh, so, for instance, childcare facilities need to be inspected. GPs need to be inspected. Um, and uh, senior care providers need to be inspected. So, um, one of the things they did was they looked at the data sets and say, could we identify from the public data where we think the most likely are that there might be a, a dysfunction or a failure? And it turns out, yes, they could. And so, for GPs, for example, um, they could, by doing physical inspections for just 20% of the GP population, they could identify 95% of the problem clinics. Uh, and so that's an example where, by using this public data, um, you can actually improve people's safety uh, and you can use uh, public resources very efficiently. So that's an example that comes to mind for me. Uh, I'm also uh, starting to advise uh, a startup in the sort of aging in place space and uh, so lately I've been doing a lot of thinking about this also with uh, aging parents and uh, the general aging of the population. Uh, I think uh, I look at some examples of technology in this space that is technical good, definitely. I mean, right before I worked at the, uh, on the project, open source project, before that I was working at the Adaptive Technology Resource Center at the University of Toronto. It now is at OCAD, and it's called the Inclusive Design Research Center. But even back then, uh, they were working on things like screen readers that allow people who are visually impaired to actually look at websites. Uh, so that's an example. Uh, we're we're going to see more and more of this with VR, 
Um, I've been hearing about uh, there's apps now with um, with uh, with VR that allows uh, people with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia to actually experience streetscapes from their youth, um, and it helps them reconnect with their memories and, and helps them keep their mind active. So there's things like that that I think are really uh, really positive. And as we're seeing now with the Asian population, we're going to have to start retrofitting, uh, thinking about the way that we move through our transit stations, our cities, our offices, uh, that, that actually normalize uh, people who are having, having more uh, trouble moving around. So there's lots of technology that can help, uh, help with that, and that's definitely tech for good. So. That's great. Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll share a, a very simple thing. Uh, it's called Say It. Uh, so a very simple thing. Uh, it's called Say It. Uh, it's, um, I think, done by the My Society people uh, in, in the UK. Uh, and they use it to capture their parliamentary uh, speech rec records and put it online so that people can easily index and search it and so on and hold their parliamentarians <coughs> to account. And this has been internationally adopted. Uh, but far as I know, I'm the only ministry in the administrative branch in the world uh, that says, you know, for all the meetings that I am a chair of, I'm also going to publish the entire transcript of whatever everybody said, even inside the government before the policy is made. Uh, and this is what we mean by radical transparency, because for most of the freedom of information acts in around the world, that only applies to after the decision is made. But that means that the citizens are consulted to when actually the policy is already formed, uh, they just want input on the implementation details, but by uh, opening up to um, more than 3,000 speakers and 700 uh, meetings that I've held in the two years since I've become the digital minister, uh, it's like putting a VR headset to everybody so people can feel what being a digital minister is like, like follow my day-to-day -day schedule and my meetings and meetings with journalists and lobbies and, and so on, uh, provided they are willing to be um, indexed by the state technology. And this technology being really simple, it turns every utterance into a social object. So we can quote on every word and turn it into a social object to be discussed on Twitter, on Facebook, on media, and things like that. And we have a whole stack of te technology to support the tra automatic transcription, translation, and so on of all the meetings into this kind of uh, permanent archival. And I think this really radically increased the trust uh, of the government to the people, right? Because people um, has to, you know, see how the government actually thinks and functions and so on. It also lowers the risk of the public servants because traditionally, if things go well, the minister get all the credit, and if things don't go well, well, it's always the public service to blame. But with this kind of radical transparency, it's the other way around. If even if things don't go very well, if things go somewhat well, um, the people who innovate actually gets the credit because you can see it in the public transcript and the journalistic people do get an insight on the why of policy making. And if things fail, it's always my fault because it's just my experimentation anyway. So because uh, the, this uh, reverse uh, payoff metric, uh, we are now uh, having a lot of corpus, what we mean uh, speech and text data that we can now use to train AI and bring into all the other um, Taiwanese communities and languages and uh, common um, you know, indigenous community and so on. So we're partnering with Mozilla on um, Common Voice, uh, which I will donate like two hours of my speech <laughs> into the AI recognition engine so people are not restricted to what Siri understand as the perfect accent, but they can always speak in their local accent and local language and leave no languages behind. So this whole speech technology stack in the service of radical transparency, I think is one of the examples of tech for good. Fantastic. Can you tell us about any downsides to radical transparency? Well, I mean, we're radical, but it's not like, like we live stream all meetings. So we do allow for 10 working days if it's an internal <coughs> meeting that I chair, or 10 days if it's an external meeting from a visitor for people to edit for professionalism. So that uh, in jokes and so on are usually taken out without losing the context. Uh, but without this uh, 10 days or 10 working days buffer, uh, that would be very dangerous uh, because then people will be afraid of speaking out. So this kind of strikes a balance just as this anonymous arrangement of e-petitioners. So uh, we try to strike a balance of having the access to the why in the context, but also have the public service uh, to in somewhat uh, free capacity to make in jokes. The only downside is that I cannot access state secrets uh, anymore because any information that comes into the system that state secret pollutes the entire system. So when there's a military drill or something and just take a day off, I still don't know where the bunkers are. Uh, so <laughs> I cannot access state uh, confidential information, but that's a conscious trade-off that I made. Very interesting. 
Just following up to your plan, it's ready. Okay. Just following up on the radical transparency, doesn't it automatically cause people to not be as transparent in their viewpoints? I mean, if you're going to publish, I mean, I'm a fan, but like, won't there be generally human in nature people who don't want to go in the direction that you're taking the conversation and who will not be honest in that conversation? Yeah. So you mean that people would would, would what refrain from speaking authentically? Yeah. Let's so say that I don't want to. Like, there's obviously going to be people who don't agree with your agenda. Sure. In course. the government, right? And so those people are also part of these meetings, I presume, yeah, right? Because it's open. Of course. Right? And so how do they get around the fact that they're going to be projected to the world openly when, and they may be the ones who are going counter to you or, or saying this. So how yeah, do people yeah, actually yeah. behave? So very simply put, uh, as an MA, a conservative anarchist, uh, I, I don't give orders, I don't take orders, so there's no agenda actually. I'm a purely facilitative minister. Uh, and so, but if people do uh, like fight in, in each other in the meetings, they have 10 days to review each other's positions. And what we discover is that after 10 days, because sometimes people in meetings, they just speak, they don't listen. Being forced to review what everybody having said, actually, after 10 days, sometimes they just go back and say, we don't have to run another consultation. I actually understand the other person's point. So ha having this review time really, really helps. But in the worst case, they can just edit their own speech out, right? Because everybody is free to edit their own speech. So we, we had an extreme case where a, a, a journalist uh, feels that well, the question that she asks is proprietary information or whatever. And if you look at my theoretical transparency, you see that everything she asks is redacted. And you just see me monologuing all the answers. Uh, so that, that's the most extreme case, but we don't usually go that extreme. Okay, so this is a very good question for all of you, right? It's a big tsunami, somebody said, coming in, right? And there's obviously blockchain and AI, but there are many more disruptive technologies, right, all together. And the key question is time, right? So I think everybody is feeling that way, right? I think you mentioned the youth program here, and as well, and it's going to actually, all these disruptive, disruptive technologies going to affect our generation and next generations as well. What do you see will be the solution, right, for, you know, what is tier one or smart cities in tier one, tier two, that they want to create this ecosystem and be part of this uh, generation of smart cities when there's a lack of uh, data scientists, data analysts, uh, ML uh, scientists as well, and neural network. Uh, so this is a lack here, it's a lack as well of talent and the world of talent in the U.S. and probably in tier one everywhere, right, where I go and I travel as well to Asia. I was there from Barcelona in a uh, smart cities event. Everywhere I go, this talent uh, work, right? So, who is, where is the solution? The lack of talent. The lack of talent. Well, I think we, we move at speed of trust, actually. Uh, without trust, the talents are there, but they kind of cancel each other out. That is my honest uh, feedback. I have worked with uh, many professional uh, ethnographers, people who are uh, specializing hanging out with people. Uh, and and they, they work uh, from the angle of, say, cultural anthropology, which focus on people, or human geography, which focus on places. And, and always they find that when people say there's not enough talent, what they actually mean is that there is no common vision or common value of that place or that um, neighborhood. Because if people do have common value, uh, the surface that you need to uh, actually do the solution, deliver a solution, is so well defined that it's, it kind of just falls into place. But if uh, it is not well defined, if you need to have a lot of competition in order to kind of swarm into a solution, then of course people feel a shortage of talent. Uh, as the minister also in charge of social innovation, what I'm trying to do is always to ask the right how may we question. We may take one year, two years to ask the right how may we question. But once we get into that point, we never find a light of talent problem. I, just, I, I think it's so important too because uh, the whole smart city uh, discourse right now uh, is it reminds me, and I, I always hate to quote Jane Jacobs, but I am on the board of James Watt. Um, it, it, it reminds me of mid century, where you had a lot of technocrats sort of deciding about what a city should be like from, from an efficiency standpoint, a traffic, a, you know, a, an investment standpoint. And what Jane Jacobs was writing was actually these are the ways that people actually live in cities. This is the way they actually this is the way they actually move through cities. This is the way that they interact with people. And I think we can't lose that, and I think that's part of what. Civic Tech is trying to do is to say, and we, we still have a long ways to go, but in some of the things you're doing, is, is how can we actually involve people 
in the design and in the consideration of the technology as it gets applied to our cities. And that's what's been missing, and I think we need to work harder to get to get there. Uh, but we'll end up with a far better, far more human uh, result than if we just simply look at the technology as a standard. Yeah, I think talent's uh, top of everyone's mind right now, particularly uh, as you know Toronto experiences this boom in the in the tech industry, having put on more jobs than uh, Silicon Valley and New York combined in the last couple of years. So um, it's definitely the, the the talent crunch is is concerned. What one thing I would add to to the points which I agree with is that um, actually if you look at the the current diversity statistics of the of the industry, it's actually not very diverse, uh, and that to me indicates an opportunity for us to to uh, tap into to talent sources that uh, for for many reasons are being overlooked right now. Uh, and so, uh, Mars recently released a diversity inclusion belonging report, uh, which talks about. Uh, we did some surveying of, of the tech community around this topic, uh, and we think it is a, a, a big opportunity for us to to uh, to grow the the talent pool um, by taking a more inclusive approach to developing the industry. Yeah, thank you. It's called Talent Fuels Tech. If anybody's interested in looking up that report, I think there's um, it's, it's pretty clear. And I know this happens in a lot of industries, but we advertise for hard skills and we hire for soft skills. So how do we bring them together? How do we meet that gap? How do we get more women into technology, more visible minorities, et cetera, et cetera? So there's a huge opportunity in that space. I'm um, now going to go to one of the questions from the survey. Um, uh, Minister, who do you surround yourself with to work? And how would you describe the skills you bring to the function you hold? Sure. Um, so my office um, is very interesting. Uh, in Taiwan, we have 34 uh, vertical ministers, meaning that they each own a ministry or a commission. And we have eight, at the moment, uh, horizontal ministers who look after the cross-ministerial uh, issues. It's always been like that uh, in, in Taiwan. And so at the moment, as the digital minister uh, in charge of open government, social innovation, and youth empowerment, um, actually my portfolio touches every single uh, ministry. And so when I joined the cabinet, there was a public negotiation period where the regular transparency and so on was negotiated. Uh, and uh, the second principle I mentioned was voluntary association. So I mean that by saying, you know, I would poach at most one volunteer from each ministry to form my office, the public digital innovation space. So theoretically, I can have 34 staff. At the moment, I have 22. Uh, but that means uh, that no single ministry, which each ministry represents a value, right? So um, it, no ministry dominates the discussion, but everybody gets into the habit of working out loud, meaning that we use the shared Kanban board, we have a rocket chat, we use all the you know collaborative tools in a cybersecurity hardened virtual workspace, of course. But that means that um, each ministry don't have a dominating discussion on the digital uh, policies, but they have to actually come up with something that work in the one workspace that is to the benefit to every other ministries as well. And so I surround myself with volunteers from like <coughs> to, uh, different groups and ministries and so on without each voice, uh, any voice dominating anything else. And then the peripheral is participation offices. In each ministry there is a team of officers tasked of meeting people who are emergent, uh, bringing emergent issues like engaging directly. And the POs, uh, I think the agricultural PO is actually here in Toronto uh, helping running the, the workshop. And we have one of these uh, PO teams in the Tainan municipality as well and there are some other municipalities. And all these is the idea that whenever there's an emergent wicked problem, a coordination problem, there is a set of people, a team in each ministry, in each bureau in the Tainan municipality to make sure that they can work as a team to uh, meet with people with emergent issues so that we can uh, work on domestic issues that escalate to national or national issues that devolve to domestic uh, without any bureaucracy involved with the same line of design thinking. So that's the kind of people that I involve myself with. And so the skill that I bring, I think, is the core internet values, which is permissionless innovation and rough consensus, and these are the core internet values that I'm, I'm bringing into the government system. 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, if I can follow up on that, that was my question. Um, um, how do you, there's that technical aspect, you know, so how do you manage that? Because your discussions, you know, you set up pretty technical tools. Mm -hmm. So you see how volunteers from ministries, but are they all technically savvy? Like, mm -hmm. how do you manage that piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. in your discussions, mm -hmm. I guess? Yeah, I, I would say that um, because I, I work with um, um, Apple, especially the Siri team, for, for six years, uh, we always value design and design as a kind of proxy of what we call on-site customers, uh, which means that all those ministries, people, they have varying levels of digital savviness, and we have to adapt our methodologies to fit all the modalities. <coughs> and we have a lot of uh, more senior people in public service who join. Uh, they are most comfortable with pencils, but if we use uh, like these kind of stylus, they're actually okay with it. But if we force them to use um, like phones, it, it doesn't work and things like that. It's very little things like that. But uh, basically, we tailor-made our digital technologies to meet with the existing um, habits and workflow with the uh, civil service. But whenever we see an opportunity that people are doing something redundant and trivial and things like that, we just automate it right away in a very opportunistic way. And so okay, that's when, the basic when, idea. When, when you say we, is that the people, that, the close to the people around you? You have a team of people who are ready to implement like Yeah, that. of course, of course. That, that's the public digital innovation space. We call ourselves a space instead of an office because we're literally like three rooms in the administration building, three rooms in the social innovation lab, a lot of virtual spaces and so on. So people can be interns. Uh, we have like 40 interns every year who just systematically look at all the government service and websites and check for mobile and responsiveness design and multilingual and whatever. And they're, they're not just debugging or doing QA. Many of them are actually versed in JavaScript and CSS. So they bring gifts, right? <laughs> to the ministry saying if you just change those two lines, your website is going to look so much better and, and things like this. So we, we build relationships so that the civil service see the young people uh, and the civic tech community as always contributors and partners instead of vendors. And so when I say we, uh, we just you know throw out interesting issues for the crowd and the collective intelligence to work with. So in many senses, I'm just a channel to amplify the collective intelligence. I don't actually personally uh, do anything uh, other than you know ordering pizza and taking the trash out and things like that. It's a very important role. Can you throw the um, like yeah. middle, in the middle, please? <laughs> I'm just wondering, uh, are you concerned about sabotage from the mainland and to the extent that you can mention it, uh, how do you deal with it? Sure. Yeah, um, I think uh, the first thing I did as a digital minister is to recompile the Linux kernel that we use in the, in the, uh, in, in the intranet. Um, and because I don't touch state secret, that's the first line of defense. But even uh, for our collaborative uh, workspace, we use this technology called Sandstorm, Sandstorm.io. And it's one of the most secure um, cloud platforms around. It is entirely open source. And we get our top notch, like DEFCON number two, um, you know, white hat uh, people to penetrate testing it for half a year and line by line because it's open source and to make sure that it's actually one of the most secure systems around. And then on top of the Sandstorm system, then all the civil service can innovate by writing you know, JavaScript applications that borders lunchbox together or whatever, uh, and then uh, not worrying anymore about the cyber security because all the uh, basic uh, defense in depth is there in place. And with the Sandstorm system, people can just adopt any open source, uh, even if it's known to have a lot of vulnerabilities, once it's contained within uh, the Sandstorm sandbox, it can't do anything, because the Sandstorm system considers all the applications as malicious, uh, and then it has a really good permission control model, and so I would encourage people who are cybersecurity um, uh, inclined to consider a system, because we get daily tests um, from um, nearby jurisdictions, uh, and so far it's been uh, really working pretty well and standing to the assault. I was thinking more in terms of data pollution. Uh, so, what do you mean? That uh, uh, they can feed you bogus uh, data uh, which can uh, disturb the conclusions. 
Right. Uh, well, there's two kinds of data, right? If you you're saying you environmental sensors and IoT devices and so on, of course nowadays uh, we manufacture most of it ourselves, and we, we substitute uh, the, uh, for example, the IP cams and so on. Uh, have, we have a, a uh, standard um, BISMI um, certification. Uh, that's one of the, the first one for the IoT devices. So for the hardware, of course, we use hard and hard hardware. This like just common sense. Uh, but for um, citizen initiated data, which you, you uh, maybe you know, uh, like uh, faking uh, consensus, uh, basically, um, we, we have many different uh, defenses. The first one, of course, being the difficulty of actually obtaining a large number of domestic SMS numbers is actually not that easy. And the second thing is that because we measure always in the first uh, diamond of design thinking, we only measure you know, the collective facts and the feelings. And the feeling uh, always only colleagues on a how might we question. The second part, which is the implementation delivery and so on, that part is actually not AI uh, automated conversation. It's always face-to-face -face consultation that's live streamed. And so it's much harder to, to troll this part. And it doesn't actually uh, mean much to troll the first part for the reason that I've already explained, because we don't measure in numbers. We measure in the quality and diversity. And if they're able to actually propose something that really resonates with lots of people, I for one would come. <laughs> Terrific. So thank you all very much for your uh, absolutely wonderful questions. I have one final question for the panelists, and I'd like them to think about their concluding remarks in our last five minutes. Um, but my question is this, and it's completely selfish. Uh, one of the things that we're very concerned at at Mars is uh, not only how we help the individual entrepreneur, but how we put a systems lens on it. So how do we address barriers to the adoption of innovation? And so what can we learn from your experience in terms of creating the receptor capacity for this way of thinking, being, doing, acting? Mm. Back to you. <laughs> We're going to start with you. Okay. You have the answer. All right. Um, yeah, just, just be really humble, I think. Um, when, when we say design, um, in, in Taiwan, because we're so good at you know semiconductor design, hardware design, supply chain management, and things like that, people usually think in an iteration cycle that's measured in half a year or a year uh, that is capital intensive, that is very precise, and things like that. Taiwan is known uh, for this kind of thing since the <coughs> personal computing. Uh, but it, it, nowadays, when we say design, uh, we have to assume a kind of humbleness. Uh, that is to say, we automatically think co-design. And that's, that's what I really mean by when we think user experience, we need to think about human experience. Because if we uh, design with the mind of users, then you're just interacting with that single slice of time that the person re uh, acts or reacts to your service or your product. But if you design with the humanity in mind, uh, with how to enrich uh, the humanity of the whole ecosystem and supply chain, rather than just uh, the user when it's using the product. And uh, I think that enables a design that opens up so much possibility, just like the social innovation space that every week people are tweaking their space uh, to reflect the social need. And so the iteration cycle has shortened uh, to one week long, essentially. You meet me on Wednesday, we make a change, and the next week you're seeing uh, roaming, self-driving you know, tricycles, and, and things like that. And, and so it is this humbleness, this participatory spirit, and the uh, um, self-awareness that the people actually always know better. And the only thing we can do is to create a social fabric uh, which the people can review their authentic selves. If we adopt this approach to design, then there can be no failures because there is no preset top-down agenda. Whatever shows up is the right thing. Whoever who shows up is the right person. Whenever they show up is the right time. And that is why we work so, so much with uh, human geographers, because uh, we see the place, uh, both virtual and uh, physical, as kind of the main social object that we're uh, working on. Uh, and the people who passes by the space, occupies the space, including the parliament, um, gets to set agenda for the space. And if we ad adopt this approach, I think the adoption itself will be driven by the people and the actual use they have to the fabric of the city and that is our vision for smart city actually the smartness is in the collective intelligence
Any final words from you, Charles? It's tough to follow. That's a tough act to follow. It I is. Bet. Yeah. It's very tough. I'll try to I'll try to live up to it. Uh, the uh, for, when, to your question around the systemic lens on things. So I think for uh, if I'm talking from the civic tech perspective, uh, it's really thinking about humans as humans, treating humans as humans, and that. Uh, so we look at some of the successes that we've had. It's because we were you know we had people in the community working with people in the government. Uh, at all levels, and we had teams in the government that have now formed digital service, central, centralized digital services, that are now thinking this way as well, that they want to include uh, communities more in the work that they're doing. And so, the, and it's the same thing in the private sector. There's like, there are people inside those companies that want to do things, and they want to, and so it's like working with them as humans. Uh, I think to your point, like the philosophy of civic tech of building with and not for, does not mean once or one off. And the work I think we still need to do is try to figure out how do we have an ongoing way of doing that and that, that, that endures and is resilient. And I, I don't think we're there yet, but I think we still, uh, so I think we have work to do there, but I'm confident we can do it. Thank you. Alex? So the Social Innovation Lab approach that, that I have been using, playing with for the last few years, um, I think it's expensive, it's slow, and it's in some ways elitist because uh, the number of people you can see in a face-to-face -face setting uh, is limited. So we're making decisions about millions of lives and yet um, most of the methods are optimized to have 30 people sitting in a room together. And so um, one thing I've been very interested in is can we mash up the methods of social innovation labs with the field of democratic deliberation so that we can do high tech and high touch together um, to get faster, cheaper, and more democratic in the way that we do these approaches. Um, Minister, you inspired me to end with some poetry. <laughs> um, this is not my own poetry. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, this is by uh, Adrian Rich. Um, what would it mean to live in a city whose people were changing, each other's despair into hope? You yourself must change it. What would it feel like to know your country was changing? You yourself must change it. Though your life felt arduous new and unmapped and strange, what would it mean to stand on the first page of the end of despair?